Uh, one announcement, we have uh, Mamu Day in the Park happening April the 1st, which is not this coming weekend, but the next weekend at uh, Mamu Walking Track from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. So come on out and be a part. We are going to have a phenomenal, a phenomenal time. Uh, this morning, I'm going to depend on our um, media team to um, put the scriptures up for us. I didn't get an opportunity or a chance. We had a lot going this week, so didn't get an opportunity and the chance to abbreviate my notes to be able to give to them. Uh, and so that's why you don't have your notes. They should be in the, uh, in the app uh, by this evening or tomorrow, however long it takes for it to post. Uh, and you'll be able to look at that and re-examine it at home. But on this morning, you're just going to have to trust me and the words that they put on the screen. Is that okay? Go with me. We're going to go to Luke, the 17th chapter. Luke's gospel, the 17th chapter. And we're going to look at verse 1. <clears throat> Luke 17, verses 1. Luke 17, verse 1. Luke 17 and 1. This height reads, can we do the King James Version? There it is. What had me going was I was looking at a couple of other virgin, versions and it wasn't using the word that I was looking for. Then said he unto the disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. I want to talk to you this morning about being armed against offense armed against offense how to defend when offense comes because the scripture tells us jesus tells us that it didn't say that offense may come it didn't say it might pass you away it's not like a hurricane or, or that you can you know how we usually pray and like well lord let it go to texas <laughs> let it miss us let it go to florida no it's not a chance that it might come but Jesus clearly lets us know that in Luke chapter 1, offense will. Say that with me. Say, will come. Offense will come. Heavenly Father, I come to you today and ask for your help. Help us, dear Lord. Help me to minister your word clearly to where it's conveyed with understanding. And Lord, let every heart receive it and let us grow because of it. We thank you for it now and we call it done in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. When we were younger, uh, you grew naturally. You went to sleep, you woke up, you grew. Ten-year-old boys want mustaches, but they don't have to work to make them grow. At 13, 15, it'll start to, it'll start to grow all on its own. They don't have to work to get taller. You don't have, they didn't have to tie, or girls, they didn't have to tie want their legs and their hands and start pulling at an early age so that they could grow. It was something that happened naturally. It's something that happened overnight. 
but if you are going, but, and, and growth is something, physical growth is something that will eventually come to a, a peak, come to a season where it will end. But growing in your maturity, maturing and growing spiritually is not something that happens while you sleep, but it's something that ha you have to be intentional about. So if you're going to mature and you're going to grow, if you're going to grow in God's word, you're going to mature in his word. That means that you're going to have to intentionally study his word. You're going to have to intentionally hear his word uh, and, and put his word into practice. You know when you are maturing, whenever you, the more you start to put God's word into practice in your life. We are growing to something. We are growing to an image. The image that God created us in. We are growing to become more and more Christ-like. The more Christ-like you become, the more you is evident that you are growing and maturing. The more you are like Jesus, the more mature you are. And so we want to continue to grow in God's word so that we can become more and more like Jesus. Ultimately, we want to look like Jesus. That, and, and that's what he wants for us. He wants to see his image in us, in our behavior, in the way that we think. That's why the Bible says, put on the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, so that we might think like Jesus. If we think like Jesus, then we're going to reason like him. If we reason like him, we would act like him. And how many of you know we could use more Jesus in the earth? Jesus said it like this to his disciples, whenever Jews, I mean Gentiles began to come to him at, at the conclusion, the end of his ministry, the, uh, Gentiles started to come to him and they began, they wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to get to know Jesus and Jesus said, oh, now my time is coming. He realizes that in the form that he was in, he was limited. Jesus was limited. You said Jesus had limitations. Yes, he did. There were limitations that Jesus had. The Bible says that wherever he went, where there was no faith, he was limited and he could not do many great works. Even, even in the bodily form that he was in, he could not pastor everybody. And when Greeks came to see Jesus, Jesus begins to say something that the disciples would understand later. He says, as long as a corn remains alive it remains alone but if it falls to the ground and it dies it will spring forth and bear much fruit it is he's simply saying past the if we get past the old king james version uh, uh of how it says it if if you plant a corn seed to the ground as long as a corn seed remains in your hand it remains alive how many people can it feed it, it will only nobody right not much, one corn kernel. But if you plant it in the ground and it, is, it dies, Jesus was speaking of his death. If he dies, he says, then it will sprout up and you will have corn cobs that have corn kernels and it'll have much fruit. Jesus referring to his death and what happens on the day of Pentecost where his spirit now lives it lived and took up residence in the life of all believers which lets it, it makes sense now the scripture that says the hope of glory is that is in you is christ in you that's the hope of glory and today we are the living body of christ so there's not just one body look what jesus did in one body imagine what he can do in every body all of these bodies in here amen Amen. <clears throat> and so we want to be more Christ-like. Because if we are like him, then we will do what he did. And what did he do? He raised the sick. He, he, he healed the sick. He raised the dead. Uh, he opened up uh, people who couldn't hear. He, he, he caused them to hear. People who were blind, he caused them to see. Uh, Jesus did many, many great, many great and amazing things. And Jesus said it like this. He said, the things that you've seen me do... He said, greater works shall you do than these if you have faith in me and believe. And so we want to mature, we want to grow, and we want to become more like Christ. There's one particular area that I want to look at on this morning where, uh, with regard to growing. And, and it's an area that's important that we grow in because it's an area that the enemy comes at people the most. The Bible tells us that a house divided cannot stand. And the question becomes, well, how does a house become divided? 
And, and the Bible tells us that the devil is divisive. That's what he does. He comes to divide. He comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And so he uses devices, things in our life that we are susceptible to. He looks at our weaknesses and he tries to capitalize on our weaknesses. So there are areas where we're weak that God says, I want you to strengthen. And one area that Jesus begins to uh, refer to them, an area that they need to take a look at to strengthen, and that is, he said unto his disciples, it is impossible that offense will come into the world. What is offense now? Offense is an annoyance or a resentment brought about by a perceived insult to a, or disregard of oneself or one standard of principles. Has any of you in here ever been offended? You were annoyed and resented somebody who offended you. Oftentimes the people who have the potential to offend us the most are not strangers. I mean, somebody you doesn't know, you don't know, passes you by and doesn't say hello. Does it bother you? Uh, they don't know me. I don't know them. But if somebody you do know that you're acquainted with passes you by on the job or in church and looks at you and doesn't say hello, well, doesn't that, don't, don't, don't they have, there's, there's grounds for offense right there. Let's move it up to somebody, not, not just somebody you know. What if a friend, a close acquaintance, what if, <clears throat> what if your pastor or your, your spouse or one of your children just passed you by and how, you know how people say that, they just walked on me. They walked, they were so close they could have walked on me and they didn't say nothing. Right? The, more, the closer you are in relation to them, the greater the offense. Even if they did something that somebody else did that you didn't know, the, the offense is greater the closer they are to you, the closer in relationship they are to you. And the devil knows that. Because he knows that, that whenever somebody is closely related to you and they do something that offends you, that's war. Do you know the bloodiest battles that have ever been fought have been civil wars? The worst battles you'll ever see is two people getting divorced. Yeah. It's amazing how two people can love each other, put money in the bank together, uh, 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 have children together, uh, uh, go through ups and downs together, and then decide to get a divorce. And oh my goodness, if you want to see some hate and some... Whew, just find two people who are getting divorced and are offended with each other. The closer the relation, the closer the relation, the greater the potential for severe, the severeness of the offense. We live in a hypersensitive society. Look at your neighbor and say, uh, don't be so sensitive. <laughs> Why are you so sensitive? Don't be so sensitive. Somebody didn't look over at you, and you, now you, now you offended. Don't be so sensitive. Somebody looked at you and said, don't be so sensitive. They didn't mean it. They did it because I told them. Don't be so sensitive because I asked them to. Don't be so sensitive. Amen. I want you to know that offense will come. Expect it. Know that it's going to come. But know what to do with it when it comes. Look what it says in Proverbs 18, verses 19. It says in the King James Version, a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. And their contentions are like the bars of a castle. So if you get somebody who is offended, if somebody's offended with you or you offended with somebody, uh, any person who is offended, it's hard to win them over once they're offended. I don't care what you do. You can give them money. You can, you, can, you can talk to them. You can show up and try to do extra. Has anybody ever got you wrong? And they were offended by something that they thought you did or they, they perceived something that was not. And so now you're going the extra mile to try to show them that, no, no, I really love you. Oh, no. And now every time you see them, you, you, you make sure you say something to them. And it still doesn't work. Why is that? Because a, a, a person who is offended, when they're offended, 
it's harder to win them than it is for somebody to win a, a wall city. You see, a city that has a wall around it is only lets people in who they trust. And, and the walls are there to keep out anybody that they don't trust or they don't want in. And so whenever a person is offended, this is what happens. When people get offended, that means they start to put up walls. And an offended person is hard to recover. It's hard to win them over. <clears throat> Paul, this is what Paul instructs Timothy and all believers on how to avoid this trap that Satan uses to get people divided, to get people upset and angry, to separate families and marriages and friendships and relationships. This is what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 through 26. He says, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know that they produce quarrels and that the Lord's servants must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone. How many? Everyone. everyone. He must be able to teach, not resentful, and those who oppose him he must gently instruct. Now, I want to stop right there. He must gently instruct them. I heard something on yesterday that I loved in that marriage conference. In, in that marriage conference, uh, it was Pastor Juan and Sister Carmen. I heard a lot of things, so many things that I love. I could preach it all day to you today. But he said, he said, if you are right, how many of you are right? You know, you know the truth. All right. If you are right, but you are rude. You're wrong. Did you get that? Doesn't matter if you're right. But if you take right and you're nasty with it. I, I, you, you can be a preacher. You can be a church. But if you're a doctor, you, your doctrine can be right. But if you're nasty with it. If you're mean with it. If you beat people with it. Then you're wrong. You can be right. And rude and make your right wrong. Look what he says. He says, those who oppose him, he must gently instruct. Now, I'm guilty for being the opposite. Because I was like, oh, I'm right. I got you. And I'm going to preach right. You know what that's like. Oftentimes when you see scripture on, on, on social media, usually somebody is, if, especially if it's one of those corrective scriptures, you know the kind of scripture that, 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 that has a correction on the inside? Of, they're usually throwing that at somebody. That's what that is. They're, usually, they're, trying, to, they're trying to whip somebody with it. And I, I have, look, I, 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 I apologize to y'all right now. Because I have whipped some of you in service. Some Sunday service, uh, I, I whipped you preaching messages trying to get somebody else that wasn't even there. <laughs> And you had to sit through it, those of you who've been well here for a while. So I'm sorry. I'll tell you, I'm sorry now. Hey, Pastor Guy, I say, don't worry about that. He say, ouch, I was one of no. <laughs> he sat through them. But I've learned that you, you, can't, you don't win anybody that way. He says, this is how we're supposed to be. That we, uh, we those who oppose him, must gently, must, mu he must gently instruct. That even though somebody disagrees with us or, or, or doesn't understand or want to receive the truth, we still don't beat them with it. We have to be gentle with it. Amen. Because even though you're right, if you're rude, you're wrong. In the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to acknowledge the knowledge of the truth. And, and, and they that will come to their senses and will escape from the trap of the devil. Who he has taken them captive to do his will. You, you know, I've seen the devil play like that. I mean, I've seen him work where, where somebody is, is they're, 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 they're doing something that's not right. Right? And you come in and you try to help them. You bring the scripture to them. And, and, and what does the enemy do to try to get them not to take the help? He gets them offended. Now they feel like a victim. Yeah, I right, will say it again. Help me preach it. Now they mad at you. And he turns it to give justification 
so that because the only thing he wanted to keep them from hearing is the truth. Every, that goes on every Sunday. I mean, if there's any time that that's at work, it's on Sunday. <laughs> that the enemy is at work doing that, it's on Sunday. He says, but if you, if you do it in the right manner, then they will escape the trap of the devil. And who, uh, the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. See, the Bible tells us of the devils that the devil is a deceiver. Satan uses deception to create offense, to, to use it like bait to entrap believers and to hold them in prison to do his will. And most don't know that they're even captive by the adversary. Have you ever taken his bait? I know I have. I have taken the bait more often than I want to admit. I'm just being honest with you. I have taken his bait more often than I want to admit. And you know what it leads to offense? If you let it into your heart, it will lead to bitterness. It will lead to bitterness. Offended people filter everything through their past hurts. People who have been offended, everything they see now, they filter it through their past hurts hurts even if somebody did justly wrong you and you interpreted it right and you get offended by it what ends up happening is everybody who looks like that person sounds like that person or does something that is similar to what they did you start to see them through those lenses you start to see them through those lenses Y'all have all heard the story about the woman who was looking out at her neighbor, who, uh, who, who neighbor's laundry was always dirty and dingy. And she would talk about her neighbor. And she's like, I don't know what it is. She don't know what Clorox is. She don't know what Tide is. She, she can't wash her clothes better than that. And she just kept, and one day she was getting ready to go tell that lady something. She kept looking out the window, judging this woman, all her dirty clothes. And, and one day somebody came to her house. She was talking to them about this woman in her dirty clothes. And said, well, she, let me see. And she, she showed the lady that was at her house visiting. Let me show you her dirty clothes. And the woman looked and she said, no, it's not the lady's clothes. She went outside and started cleaning the woman's window. It wasn't the clothes that was dirty. It was the window she was looking through that was dirty. How often, how often is it the window that we're looking through? That's what's dirty. That we're, maybe we're seeing a situation because of some past hurt that happened. And now everything this other person does, we are seeing them through the same lenses, through dirty lenses. That's the enemy's hope. That we will see people and we'll see what's happening through dirty lenses. People who are offended, they put up walls. They produce bad fruit. They find scripture to back their position. Thereby they confuse people, causing innocent people to stumble. The knowledge of God's word without love leads to pride. Second Timothy verses three, uh, 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 chapter three, talks about a form of godliness, but denied the power thereof. There are two categories of people. There are two categories of people. There is people who were wronged, and then there are those people who have think they've been wronged. When a person is deceived, he or she believes that they are right even when they are not. When people feel wronged, that they are innocent, they hold back forgiveness. Another thing I heard in that marriage conference is with regard to your spouse, but with regard to anybody, is that if anybody does you something wrong, redeem them. And that's what Jesus did for us. How many of you did something wrong? And he had to buy you back. He redeemed you. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus didn't leave us. He didn't say, okay, well, they didn't messed up. They lost their value. Uh, they sold themselves into slavery, into sin. And now uh, that, that's on them. No, 
Jesus didn't even wait for us to get right to come and to redeem us. Like, oh, now you got some value now. Come on over here. You, you've stopped all that sinning and you're doing the right thing. And, oh, man, you look more and more like me every day. Come on, let me, let me have you. No, no, no. That's not what he did. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. God redeemed us even though we were sinners. Think about that for a moment. Think about that for a moment. And I love the analogy that Pastor Juan gave. He said, imagine if you did something wrong on your job. And then you're supervised. And now you're standing before the big boss. But then your supervisor comes in and says, no. Don't get upset with them. Don't blame them. It's my fault. Punish me. I mean, how would you feel about that? Wouldn't that endear them to you? Wouldn't you feel better about that person? See, that's what Jesus did for us. The Bible says that he forgave. He who knew no sin became sin that we who were sinners might be made free. He came in and he stood and he said, no, 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 they're innocent. Punish me. And he took our charge. And I didn't love him the way I should then. But boy, after that, he forgave me and gave me opportunity to become who he wanted me to be because he, because he redeemed me and he keeps redeeming me yes, yes. over and over again. So that I can give it, could it be that you have something great in a spouse? You have something great in a friend and all you have to do is redeem them. Could it be that you have a, a good child, but you won't let them live down what has happened and all it will take for them to be able to catapult, be catapulted into their destiny is for somebody to be willing to redeem them? Grace. All of us need it. All of us deserve it. Look what we don't deserve it. Let me back up. We don't deserve it. All of us need it, right? What keeps people from redeeming others what keeps people from uh, getting over the offense number one thing is pride pride i can say amen to that i'll lift my hand on that one again i'm guilty i'm guilty just because you've been mistreated doesn't mean that it gives you permission to hold on to offense you, does, just because somebody did you something that was wrong doesn't mean you have permission that you have the right to continue to hold on to that thing look at your neighbor and say let it go let it go. How we respond to offense determines our future. It determines our future. I saw, and this happens all over. If you, you can, you will, you can end up with nobody around you because you're so easily offended by everything. A young man came to me the other day and, and he was, uh, we were talking. He believes in God. Is what he says. But he doesn't go to church. And even his uh, uh, girlfriend's fiance is like, well, I don't see that you love God. And he started talking to me about why, you know, he didn't say why. He just said that, you know, there's I've seen there's a lot of people who are not genuine that are preaching that shouldn't be preaching. I said, that's right. And there's a whole lot of teachers who shouldn't be teaching and a whole lot of nurses who shouldn't be nursing and a whole lot of doctors who shouldn't be doctoring. It's bad everywhere. But my relationship with God is not based on people. And I said, if you let and, and he might have genuinely come into a church and he saw some stuff that was not right. I said, but if you allow this kind of offense to cause you to put up walls that every time you go into church, now you're looking to find all of the other fake folk and you can't hear the word of God because you're too busy looking for the fake folk that you can't hear the truth. You become suspicious of everybody now. If you do that, I don't care what church you go into. You will never be able to receive anything. You'll never be able to grow. I don't care what relationship you get into. If you hold on to and fall into the trap of offense, you will never be. You will find yourself alone. And you'll justify why you're alone. And you get angry with God because you are alone. Because you held on to offense. God wants to use us. But we have to arm ourselves because the enemy uses offense to try to stop us from being used to love people. Revelations 
3 and 18 says, Buy from me gold refined in fire. In the fire, the real you comes out. Did you know that? In fire, the real you comes to the surface. The enemy uses pride to keep the real you from coming to the surface. No, he uses pride to keep you from seeing the real you when it comes to the surface. From seeing the real you when it comes to the surface. One of the things I had as a young man was I, I don't know why, but I just felt like it was wrong to acknowledge that I was wrong. I felt like it was wrong to acknowledge that I didn't know something. And somebody would try to explain to me to help me. Something. I know, I know, I know, I know. Oh, I know, I know, I know. What was that? Pride. Pride, right? Pride hinders and it hardens the heart. It hardens the heart. It hardens the heart. And, and the fruit of bitterness and the anger and resentment are able to flourish in a hardened heart. Unlike gold, which is soft, tender, and flexible. So you want to have a heart like gold. You want to have a heart that's flexible, that's tender, that's pliable. We don't want a hard heart. We don't want a hard heart. So our response to offense that comes should be that of refining. <clears throat> the burning off of anger, the burning off of bitterness, and, the, and envy that makes us more and more like God. Amen. It's a terrible life walking around offended all of the time. Suspicious of everybody. Amen. There's some, I hate using these terms, but there's some black folk that can't receive anybody who has lighter skin color than them because one person was offended them. There's some light-skinned folk, people who have less pigment in their skin, can't receive somebody who has more melanin in their skin because of some kind of offense. And now you got people who are great people walking around hating each other because they won't put the walls down to come to understand each other so that they will find out how much they are alike and how we are better together. That's a true statement. I see that everywhere. All, look, every, every uh, there are multiple places that I've gone in. Uh, I went to a Chiefs conference and it had better together. There's, they have that. For, they just use that everywhere for all. But it's a true statement. Better. We are better together. We are better together. We can do more together. We can do more together. When, whenever a husband and a wife are on a, the same team, they're better together. Amen. You, you, listen, you can be a good mama raising your child by yourself. You can. You can. But you can never be the kind of mother you could be and have the kind of results you could have if, if it was you and your husband together doing it. If it was you and your wife doing it together. There is a synergy that comes when two people come together on something. That's why Jesus didn't send them out by one, but he sent them out in pairs. Because he knew that there was power in togetherness. That there's power when we're able to come together. And the enemy knows that there's power when we come together. And so he does, he works like hell to try to divide us as a people. He wants to divide brothers and sisters. He wants to divide, divide husbands and wives. He wants to divide church members. He wants to divide people in our community. He wants to divide us. Because when we come together, oh, what happens? I want to give you a couple of keys to getting free. To to see clearly and to stop defending yourself whenever you get offended. Look what Matthew chapter 24 verses 10 through 13 says. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Jesus says that. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Now, when can false prophets work the best? When people are deceived. False prophets rise up and have, they are emboldened and empowered whenever people are offended with each other. Anytime, anywhere in a church, in a, in a, in a household, what, a false prophet don't look like what you think they look like. A false prophet can be that girlfriend that's talking to you on the phone that you would not have listened to her advice, but because you're so offended with him. Now she's got your ear. Now he's got your ear. 
You wouldn't have listened to that woman. You wouldn't have paid too, too attention to her at all. Wouldn't have given her a second thought, but because you're offended by something your spouse did. You wouldn't have hooked up with that sister in church. She don't have, she, she knows, the, knows a little bit about the word, but there ain't no God in her. She got a form of God, godliness, but she doesn't have any power at all. And now she's the best thing in the world. Because they capitalize on, the devil capitalize on offense. Look what it says. And many false prophets shall rise up. That's how they can come up whenever we're offended and divided. And shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax, wax cold. But he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. What was the problem? Why are these false prophets able to arise? Why is all of this able to happen and deceive? Because the love, love has waxed cold. How do we overcome offense? Love. But not any kind of love. Not any kind of love. Not the kind of love that says, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Not, not the kind of love that says that if you wash my hand, I'll wash yours. Not the kind of love that says, if you do right by me, I will do right by you. Not the kind of love that says, if you love me, I will love you back. Not that kind of love. That's not the kind of love I'm talking about. That's not the kind of love I'm talking about. That's, that's a different kind of love. That's called phileo love. But the kind of love that I'm talking about that will help you to overcome offense and keep the, 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 the false prophet from coming in and to keep the, the, the deception from coming into your life and you walking around deceived, it's called agape love. This is what agape love looks like. Jesus gave us a demonstration of it while he was hanging on the cross, crucified, and the people who crucified him standing there watching him as he is dying and he looks up to heaven and he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Forgiving people who hurt you. I, this is what agape love looks like. I love you even though you don't love me back. I love you. Agape is I will do good to you even though you do me wrong. I love you. I will give to you even if I never receive anything from you. That's agape love. That's the kind of love we need. That's the kind of redemptive love we need to show to everybody around us. I want you to think for a moment. All of us in here has been offended. Is everything that has offended you, have you justly been offended? Have you really been offended? Or do you just believe you've been offended? And even if somebody has really offended you, should you hold on to that offense? No. Because when you hold on to that offense, you put up walls. When you put up walls, you look through the wrong lenses. When you look through the wrong lenses, you misjudge people. When you misjudge people, the work of God goes undone. And your light starts to dim. And you fall into the enemy's trap. And you miss out on relationship. And you miss out on friendship. And you miss out on the work of God. But saints of God, we don't want that. And so we're going to have an agape love to people. Now, that's not, that's not an easy kind of love to have. You can't be immature and have that kind of love. You got to be mature in your faith. You got to realize that, hey, wait a minute, I've been in need of forgiveness too. And you know, one of the things that helped me was looking at myself. You know, there are times where my wife couldn't, there are times where we, we weren't able to go somewhere or do something. And somebody might have felt as if we, we just, oh, I can't believe they didn't come to my thing. And they felt some kind of way, slighted in some kind of way. That they didn't come. Well, they just didn't care about us. No, we were arguing. <laughs> we couldn't get on the phone like, no, we having a tissy. We in a fuss. We in a fight. And we, ain't, we can't come right now because I'm upset with her. And we're not talking to each other right now, so we're not coming. Because it's going to be very uncomfortable walking around talking to all of you guys and not talking to each other. And you know. Have you ever thought maybe there could be some other reason than the reason that you think that somebody's done you something wrong? How about we lean more to the side of defending them than, the, than accusing them? How about we believe the better in the person and give them... 
a pass or redemption. Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 19 says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things that are honest in the sight of all men. And if at all possible, as much as you live, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place, no place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So stop looking for people to pay back if they've done you something wrong. Joel 22 and 25 says, and I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. The caca worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. See, God said, you don't have to worry about paying anybody back. He said, you love them. He says, there's nothing that happens that's unjust that I don't deal with. Amen. He said, I'll see about them. I'll take care of it. You just keep doing what you're supposed to do. Amen. You remember Joseph's brothers? The Bible says that because he was a dreamer, they sold him into slavery. They hated him because he had a dream. And when they threw him into a pit, they said, now we'll see what will become of this dream. But let, let me share something with you, saints of God. Nothing can stop what God has put in you to do. Nothing. I don't care what anybody, you don't have to hate anybody, pay nobody back. You just keep loving. You keep uh, uh, helping people. You keep believing the best in people. And you keep doing the will of God and letting your light shine. And forgiving people and, 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 and uh, redeeming people. Because nothing can stop your destiny. Nothing can stop God's purpose and his will for your life. Amen. I don't care what people try to do to you. No one holds your destiny but God. No man, no woman, and no devil in hell can stop God's will for your life. Look what 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 7 through 8 says. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? That's what he says. He said, just go ahead on and let it be wrong then. Let them, if they're gonna, let them cheat you. That's okay. Then, then you, you, you've been cheated. You'll survive it. And he'll strengthen you through it. He's the ultimate blesser. Can't nobody rob a child of God. Did you know that? You can take it from me, but then God will get it from you. And he might not come directly from you to me, but he'll get to somebody else, then to somebody else, and then to somebody else until he get right back to me. He said he will restore what the canker worm and the palmer worm and the locust has eaten up. Amen. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7 says, love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not proud, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it's not recording, making a record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and it always perseveres. Galatians 6 and 9 says it like this, let us not become weary in doing good. Don't get weary, saints, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up, don't get weary in well doing. Amen. You keep doing and you're going to reap a harvest. Jesus leaves us an example. First Peter chapter two, verses 20 through 23 says, but if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. And when they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And that's God. Come on, stand up on your feet, saints. <clears throat> There's a great work that God wants to do in you and through you. And the enemy uses offense to come to bring, to upset you and to stop you and to discourage you and to limit you. He uses pride to keep us from seeing who we really are.
because he wants to divide. But saints, we're better together. And I thank God that he doesn't leave us ignorant of the enemy's devices, but that he gives us the tools that we need to arm ourselves against offense. To arm ourselves so we don't fall in the trap of the adversary. So that we could go out and let our light shine and that nothing would hinder our light from shining. So that we could be the people that God has called us to be. There's a world that's walking in darkness and it needs your light. There, there are people who are hurting and broken and they need for you to share that it's going to be okay. They need to know that you understand. And the enemy would use offense to stop you from being the help and the healing and the encouragement and from bringing the word and from being the key that unlocks the door and the answer to their problem and to stop it through offense. But I thank God that you've made up in your mind that I'm not going to let offense stop me. I'm not going to be somebody who is sensitive and easily offended. But my heart is going to be pliable like gold. And I'm going to be somebody that's going to, I'm going to love. I'm going to be somebody that's going around redeeming. You see, you got to be rich to redeem. You got to be rich to redeem. Going around buying back stuff. Amen? Amen. But God is going to bless you in a way to go out and buy back some stuff. There's some stuff the enemy has taken from you, some time that he's robbed you of. And God is getting ready to put deposit some love in your bank account. And you getting ready to make a withdrawal. And you're going to buy back everything that the enemy has stolen from you. You're going to buy back. The Bible says that, that he's gonna, you're going to be repaid several times. Whatever the enemy taken from you. And that we're going to resist the, the, the enemy. And the Bible says that he'll flee. But when the, whenever you resist the devil, he doesn't just leave one way. But the Bible says that he leaves seven ways. I love that number seven. Whatever stole, it says it'll be repaid seven times. When the enemy runs, he'll flee seven ways from me. You're God's man. You see, somebody right now is still struggling with addiction. Somebody is still, you can't, you just can't do, you, you, you can't have a good relationship. It looks like every relationship ends terribly. And you think it's the other person. But somebody today is still struggling in their future because they haven't gotten over a past offense. I want to give you this. I want to give you a little insight, be a little transparent. I remember as a young man, I heard my mother had married a man. He became my stepfather. He wasn't a perfect man. He had issues. He had addictions. He did. But God used him. To help me to become who I am today. But there were some things that I, I couldn't understand. Because one of which was that he came. I was 10 years old. And he kind of took mama's attention away. Because before he got there. It was just me and mom. And my brother. And, and some of his issues. They were hurtful. And it was tough growing up. And, and I, I remember feeling that mom had made a decision and she chose him over us. And that was tough, you guys. And I can remember not knowing when I became angry at my mother. And I was angry with her. I, would, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know I was angry. I didn't, I didn't know I was angry. But one day I was reading, we were reading the scripture, we were reading the Bible. And, and I don't know if we were, at, we, we were listening, we had gotten to the car and we were listening to a, uh, a message. I don't remember exactly what it was, but something brought to my attention that how you treat your parents is how your children will treat you. And I thought for that moment, I started to think about. Well, how do I treat my mom? And it was at that moment, I realized that I was very short with my mom. 
when she would talk on the phone, I was real, real short with her. You know, I wouldn't add to a conversation. My mom been good to me. When it came time to get this church, she put up everything she owned. She put up everything she owned. House and all. Every stitch of everything she had. Not only her, my brother too. The guy that greets you at the door, everything he had, he put up so that we could purchase this building. Amen. They never said it. They never told any person. I'm the first person. I'm telling you first. First time you hear it, I'm the one telling you. They never said a word about it. But I was so angry with her. I, I didn't know. And I didn't realize that I was treating her out of anger. But I wasn't angry at that time when I talked to her. But I know my children. I started thinking about how my children saw me talk to my mother. And listen, now I'm a preacher. I'm the pastor of Word Ministries at that time. And I said, well, why am I angry? I'm not angry with her. Why am I, why am I acting in, in angry with her like that? Why am I treating her this way? And I realized that it was a past offense. Whether I had really been offended or not, had justification for my offended, I had been offended. And I had never dealt with that offense. And because I hadn't dealt with that offense, it called, I treated my mother in a way that I shouldn't, and my children saw it, and guess what? They were on their way to treating me the same way I treated her. Some of the things we're dealing with right now is because there is an offense that we never got over that happened in our past. Maybe when we were children, somebody said something or did something to us, and here it is. We're still offended. Don't even know that we're offended, but we're holding on to it. Angry. Don't even know why. And today... I want you to be free of that. I remember calling my mom on the phone and saying, Mom, I'm sorry. She was like, for what? I said, because I've been angry with you, and I didn't know I had permission to no longer be angry. That it was just something I hadn't dealt with in my past. I went to my mom and hugged my mom and loved my mom, and I started thanking her for everything she's done. Could it be that you're dealing with an addiction? Because you're, you're, you are still rebelling for somebody against somebody who has offended you or you feel some kind of way. Could it be? Could it be that an offense that happened years ago is, is affecting your future right now? Well, I want to encourage you today, whatever it is, let it go. Let it go. Call them, forgive them, write them a letter if you don't want to forgive them. Because it's not worth holding on to. It's not worth holding on to. Let it go. Amen. And I want to pray for you today. Today you might be holding on to an offense. Something happened to you. Maybe it was justly something happened to you. Or maybe you just misread something. And you want to let it go today. You don't want any. I say I don't want anything hindering me and my future. Me going forward. Because of somebody I haven't forgiven. That today is the day that I'm going to redeem. I'm going to redeem that person. In my heart, I'm going to redeem. They might have already died and gone on. But you still need to redeem them. You still need to get rid of this thing. Then you come right now. And there might be somebody in here you can't forgive yourself because of something you did. Or some things you did. Maybe you weren't there for the kids. So what? Maybe you were the one responsible for the marriage going awry. So what? Maybe you did make a bad decision. Sometimes one of the hardest person or the hardest people to forgive are ourselves. And you won't ever go further until you forgive yourself. If now you know better and you say, I want to be a better mom, I want to be a better husband, I want to be a better father, I want to be a better person, I want to be a better man or woman. Then the first step is to forgiving yourself. Jesus has already forgiven you. You forgive you. This healing is going to take place. Because that produces sickness in us. You can't have the joy you need and the strength you need. You know what I was going to do? I was going to take a backpack. 
And everybody who offended me, I was going to go over all fences and I was going to put a weight, another weight in that backpack. And during the service, I was going to walk around with it. Then at one point, I was going to take it off. And I was going to get some of you to come out of the audience and come up and I was going to put the backpack on you. Just to show you what life is like when you're carrying offense. It's heavy. You can't run carrying offense. You can't, fun you can't love carrying offense. You can't function carrying offense. You can't mother. You can't father. You can't minister carrying offense. It's time to let it go. God said, I got you. I'll avenge it. Just let it go. He wants to make you stronger. He wants to arm you against offense. So when the enemy wants to come to divide you, when he wants to come to mess up in your marriage, when he wants to come and mess it in your ministry, when he wants to come and mess up on your job, when he wants to come and bring discord in your family, that said, oh, you can come with it, devil, but I am armed against offense. You might come with it, but it ain't going to work here, not in this house. No, no, no. I'm, I'm ready for you, devil. I know the truth now. And so if you come with it, just as quick as it comes is as quick as I'm going to forgive it. Just as quick as it comes, that's how quickly I'm going to redeem it. Just as quickly as it comes, that's how quick I'm going to throw love on it. <coughs> Some people can't move forward because they can't get over. Bishop Hansi talked about the historian. <clears throat> Some people are historians because they remember every wrong thing that somebody's ever done. People would do better. They just can't live down your, the history you have on them. Look at your neighbor and say, let it go. It's over with. It's over with. I'm going to, I am erasing the history. Somebody got video. You need to delete it. Somebody got a, a recording of somebody that said something wrong about you, betrayed you. Delete it. So what? So let it go. That's it. Do you know that God doesn't hold any record of wrong on us? Well, how does he do it? Is he, is he, is he, uh, does he have, uh, what is that? Whenever you, you start to lose your memory, I'm, I might have it. Dementia. dementia. <laughs> does God have dementia? No. Then why does he forget it? Because he chooses to. And you were made in his image and his likeness. And if you choose to forget it, you can too. You can too. You can too. If you choose to forgive it, you can too. Has to happen because you can't carry that weight going forward and think you're going to run far. Amen. Amen. Today, there is somebody who wants to forgive you. And his name is Jesus. He wants to forgive you of your sins. You say, I made some mistakes, Pastor. I messed up. I've done some wrong. Sure, everybody has. Yeah, but I'm not perfect, God. I'm not perfect. I'm not, I don't want to play with God. I'm not going to come to God and play with him. I'm going to come. I'm going to be perfect. No. You see, the truth is, if you could fix anything, get anything right about your life without God, you wouldn't need him. The Bible says, come just as you are. It says that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ was dying for us. He loved us that much. Before we, we even loved him or, or wanted to be around him, he was giving us a pass. He was, he, was, he was redeeming us, buying us back. And he promises us heaven, everyone who believes in him, and forgiveness of sins. Is there anybody in here, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but today you want to accept him as your Lord and Savior because you want your sins forgiven and you want to go to heaven. Then believe on the Lord Jesus. Well, the Bible says that God loved the world so much, he gave the life of his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And let me tell you what's going to happen if you believe in Jesus. 
He's going to put His Holy Spirit on the inside of you the moment you believe. The Holy Spirit will awaken on the inside of you. And the more you look to Him, the more He will fill you with His Spirit. And you will change. You will change. He will change you from the inside out. And the stuff you used to do, little by little, you won't do anymore. Some things you'll just quit cold turkey, but there's some things that he will progressively move out of your life. There's some stuff he's still progressively moving out of my life. And I have been saved for over 27 years. God did it for me. He'll do the same for you. Amen. Amen. But I know heaven is guaranteed for me. I don't worry about if I die. I know I'm going home to meet the Lord. And if you want to know that you're going home to meet the Lord, come and give your life to Christ right now. Don't worry about anybody or what people say or what they think. So what? Nobody's opinion is worth going to hell over. Come and give your life to Christ. And receive salvation. And receive healing. Is only in Jesus. Come with your problems, your hookups, your hangups, your, all of your issues. Come. Come. And he said, I'll forgive you. And I'll help you. I'll save you. Come. I want to pray. You want to pray, minister? I just want you to lay hands on everybody. Touch everybody. Make sure you touch everybody. God is going to give you help right now. We're going to we come and agree with you that God is going to strengthen you so that you can let it go. That God is going to arm you against offense. That offense is not going to come to hinder you or stop you any longer. Amen? Are you ready to receive? Lift up your hands right now. Lift up your hands like you're ready to receive right now. If you're ready to receive right now, lift up your hands right now. Right now. Eddie, would you come help us pray, Eddie? Right now. Lift up your hands. We're going to pray right now. Thank you, Lord, for doing it right now. Right now. Minister, would you come? Would you come, Sister Neil? Come right now. Come on, just lay hands on them for me right now. Lay hands on them. Yeah. Right now. Right now. No longer. No longer is it going to hold you bound. No longer. No longer. I want you to receive it right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Forgiveness is coming. Healing is coming. He's removing the weight right now. It's coming off right now. Everything you've been carrying is coming off right now. Your future is changing right now. You are taking a different direction. You're on a different course right now. Marriages are being brought back together again right now. Father, forgiveness is taking place right now. Healing is taking place right now. Restoration is taking place right now. God, I just thank you for doing it right now. God, we know that only through your divine power can it happen. And we believe, dear Lord God, right now, that it is done now in the mighty name of Jesus as they stand in faith, dear Lord God, do what we cannot do on our own. Lord, we say today we need your help. We need your help, dear Lord God, to love the way you love. We need your help today to give the way you give. We need your help to forgive the way you give. We cannot do it alone. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. And we thank you today for being the help that we need. We thank you today for you said in our weakness, your strength is made perfect. We call it done now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. All believers say amen. Amen. And amen. And amen. I want to pray with you. Because you're getting ready to leave from here right now. I want to pray with you right now. Grab the hand of the person next to you. I want to, I want to, I want to decree a special blessing over you. Because you're getting ready to go back to your family. You're getting ready to go back on your job. You're getting ready to go back into your community. You're getting ready to go back, and I want, I want to pray a special blessing over you as you leave from here. Dear Lord God, right now, I pray for your favor as they have found favor with you, so highly favored by you 
dear Lord God, that they would find favor with people. They would find favor with people where they go. Unordinary, unnatural, unfavor, dear Lord God. Dear Lord God, I thank you right now that doors are going to be open for them and oppor doors, of, doors of opportunity, dear Lord God, to go out and witness to you that doors are opening right now to proclaim your gospel. Lord, I thank you for giving them the strength that they need, the boldness that they need right now to go out and to declare your word. And Lord, I pray right now that you would bless them financially, dear Lord God. Father, that it would not be anything that they struggle with or have, have a, a worry about, dear Lord God. But I thank you for your financial blessings, dear Lord God, so they can go out and be a blessing to the, your people and to your kingdom, dear Lord God. I thank you right now for doing it. I thank you, dear Lord God, for divine health, supernatural health, dear Lord God, right now as they go out from this place. I thank you, dear Lord God, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper, and every tongue that rises up against them you shall condemn. I pray, dear Lord God, that their businesses would be blessed and their businesses would prosper, dear Lord God. I thank you, dear Lord God, that their children, Heavenly Father, are covered by your blood and your angels have been given charge over their marriage and over their families and over their household dear Lord God father I thank you that they're gonna walk in a world that is filled with danger but that they're gonna have peace and be safe because they are guarded and protected by you dear Lord God I just thank you right now for the work that you're doing in their life and as they go dear Lord God let them go blessed in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Somebody say amen. And amen. And amen. We have a christening this morning. We have a christening this morning. And I want to ask if the parents godparents great grandparents everybody the village that comes to raise this baby would be here we have babies plural babies plural babies plural oh i know these babies oh i know these babies oh my yeah Come on over here to now these two parents here are two amazing people. What's up, Papa? Ah. Hey, Mama. Today we come to christen Princeton and Serenity Clark. The Bible tells us a story about a woman named Hannah. She wanted a child. Couldn't have one, so she goes to God and asks God, God, if you give me a child, I promise you I'm going to raise him up to know you. And God hears her, and he does exactly what she asked, and he gives her a child. She has a boy. That boy is going to be named Samuel. And Samuel is going to become the next prophet over Israel. She understood how important it is that her children, her child, knew God. And today, these parents have come because they know how important God's help is. You come to declare before everyone that you can't do it, you can't raise them alone, that we need his help. You know what I love about this young couple here is that this is y'all are not just here for a baby christening and we don't see you anymore. But you're always here. Going out witnessing, serving, helping. Let me tell you something. You're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing with these kids. And everything that God has promised they are going to possess. That they're going to find favor 
wherever they go. God is going to put people around them that are part of their destiny. And they're going to live out his will and his purpose for their life because they see mom and dad love God, they're going to love him too. And they're going to be blessed because of it. And so today, can I have mom? Oh, boy. You going to come to me? Come on, come on. Oh, oh. Come on, come on, come on. Let me hold him right back. <laughs> well, that's okay. We're going to hold him right there. He loved daddy. <laughs> Heavenly Father, today, we come right now. And we present to you the gift that you gave. Lord, we present them back to you. For we know they belong to you. They're here with us only on loan. They're here with this family only on loan. But they belong to you. But while they're here, dear Lord God, in the care of these parents, they declare to you today that they are going to take care of what belongs to you. And they ask for your help. They need your child support to help them to raise them up to know you. They need your help and to be strengthened so that they can walk with them and teach them. They, they, they know they cannot do it without you. And so they lean on you to help them be the parents that their children need them to be. And I thank you, dear Lord God, today for being just that. I thank you, dear Lord God, that your favor and your hedge of protection and your angel army surrounds these two babies. And dear Lord God, that they're going to find favor and purpose and blessings. And they're going to live out their destiny with your help. I thank you for giving these two parents all that they need to be all that you've called them to be. And I thank you for being to them all they need you to be. All this right now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. amen and amen. So we dedicate these two today back to the Lord with a kiss. Mom, would you bless Dad? Ah, come on, Pop. There we go. Mm -hmm. Come on, Uncle. Come on right here. Come here, young lady, right here. All right. Come on, come on. Oh. Look at here, look at here. Ah. Come on, who wants to hold my serenity? So today, we dedicate to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as the testament of your faith in him to guide you and to raise serenity in Princeton. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit on this day, March 19th, 2023, here at Word Ministries, officiated by myself, according to what Mark chapter 10, verses 14 says. Suffer the little children to come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And amen. Come here, Pop. Oh. <laughs> Well, we thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Congratulations. Can we take pictures right here? Awesome. Can I get the family? Let's line up right here, guys. Now, I'm going to take a picture first. Right here. All right, now listen, I'm going to move and you can take a picture without me. You here for your baptism? 